they would. <laughs> yes. Good morning. Hiding over here behind this tree. <laughs> Welcome to worship on this second Sunday of Advent. It is hard to believe it is already December 5th. And what an amazing day we have in store for us. Um, welcome to all of you. Uh, greetings, favored ones. The Lord is with you. And now opportunities for ministry from our pastor. I had to get or or get myself put together there. <laughs> Several things just uh, coming up over the next few weeks to let you know about to make sure that you are aware. Next Sunday, immediately after worship, is the board meeting. Um, on Wednesday the 15th, which is, we changed it. It's not when we normally meet. The worship team is meeting. At least that's what I wrote in my calendar. If I wrote it down wrong, somebody let me know. <laughs> um, the following Sunday, the 19th, is the quarterly business meeting. You received, I believe, a letter from Ruth this week talking about some of the things we're going to be having conversation about um, on that day. So, um, Make sure that if at all possible, you are here for that. Um, Tuesday, the 21st in the evening will be the longest night service at seven o'clock. Is there also a ladies luncheon that day, Carol? There is at Tippecanoe Place. At Tippecanoe Place on the 21st is also the ladies luncheon. Um, and it's always decorated beautifully this time of year. So let Carol know if you can attend that. Then on Friday the 24th, again at 7 p.m., will be our Christmas Eve service here in the chapel. Those are all of the um, opportunities that I am aware of. Am I missing anything? All right. Thank you, Pastor. And now I invite us to prepare our hearts and our minds for worship and hear these words. Oh, my soul magnify the Lord. God is worthy to be praised.
The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Let us light a candle for the prophets who have claimed their hopes, desires, and dreams. Let us keep their flame growing, glowing strong in our hearts, even now. A voice was heard of one calling, In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. In this season of awaiting and pondering the coming of God in Christ, let us light a candle for Mary and Elizabeth, and let us in our own hearts dare to believe the impossible by surrendering ourselves to God, courageously cooperating with God's creative pregnant power in us, for us, and through us. May we, like Mary and Elizabeth, become pregnant with holy aliveness. And now let us stand as you are able and together read responsively this call to worship. Our souls magnify the Lord. Our spirits rejoice in God our Savior. The mighty one has done great things for us. Holy is God's name. God's mercy is ever near from generation to generation. God's strength scatters the proud, but lifts the humble of heart. God's love fills us up, nourishing our hungry souls. God's grace has called us here, strengthening our lives of faith. Will you join with me singing verse one of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel? <laughs> Now, would you join with me in our unison invocation, which will be followed by the Lord's Prayer. God of joyous expectation, come to us this day. May the miracles in our lives fill us with wonder. May an encounter with your goodness and grace cause our hearts to leap within us. Receive us into the arms of your mercy that we may feel you near us and rest secure in your many blessings. Amen. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading comes from Luke uh, chapter 1, and it's kind of the uh, Reader's Digest condensed version. It's abridged, actually. So listen carefully to this beloved story and allow the imaginations of our hearts and minds receive this reading. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and both were getting on in years. Once when he was serving as priest before God, there appeared to him an angel of the Lord who said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. For your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. After those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, this is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favorably on me and took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. We come to that moment now in our worship service when we remember our stewardship and we bring our tithes and offerings to the Lord. There are offering plates at the back of the, uh, our sanctuary, and however you give, whether you give online or mail in a check or bring your gifts, let us do so as stewards of all that God has entrusted to us. Let's pray. Glorious God, source of every good gift, bless our tithes and offerings this day. May they lift up the lowly. Fill the hungry with good things and bring strength and mercy to those in need. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the doxology as you are able. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here. be seated. It's time for connection. So how many of you have Netflix? Excellent. Have you seen the movie Jingle Jangle? 
Forrest Whitaker, Felicia Rashad, and Keegan Michael Keyes or Peel, or I, I can never remember who's who. Okay, so here is the story. There is a an inventor, and his inventions get stolen, and his granddaughter has a gift to do the same kind of inventing that he did. Um, and she, uh, who has been estranged from him, um, she goes to visit him and there are lots of things that happen, um, but she inspires him to invent again. Um, it's a, I, I highly recommend it, but there is a moment, it's like the little orphan Annie tomorrow song moment when she is pondering, where's the grandpa that I was told so much about? The, the really inventive, creative man. Um, what happened to that guy? Where's the magic, right? And so I'm tying this to our stories today because that's essentially what it is, right? The, the Hebrew people had been promised many, many wonderful things. And for many of them, it was a, well, where is it? And so I'm gonna play just a little bit of maybe the first 40 seconds, maybe, maybe the first minute, if it works, of the song so that you can kind of get the sense and then, and then you will be inspired to see it because it's a really cute movie. But, and then I'll have one more thing to tell you to share after we see that. Please, Mark. Where's the world that you created and the stories that you painted with words that made me feel ten feet tall where's the magic in the moonlight the surprise hidden in sight no i don't see to inspire much at all And I'm ready now to fly away And gravity won't get up Thank to say It's my choice if I need to touch the sky Is it possible that the square root of impossible is me. It's so possible. Watch me rise high above my Thank you. I mean, it's a four minute song, but you get the idea. <laughs> you get the idea. She starts kind of distraught and then she realizes that she is the possibility. And that's where we are with the story, right? The idea that the people were hopeless and then God comes to them. And there's that possibility, there's that chance. And, um, and Elizabeth heard it and Mary heard it. And the, the change then is that through God, the impossible becomes possible. And that's it. Amen. All right. We come now to our time of prayer, of sharing our concerns and our joys. Um, I will remind you, as I always try to, that we are live on Facebook, so be careful with what uh, details you might share. But um, who would like to share something this morning? Joyce. I asked for prayers for my cousin, the Brown family. My cousin Bev lost her mother the 1st of November. Excuse me. And now her husband, at that time, we found out he had a brain tumor and with chemo and everything, his, he's very weak, so. Okay, so the Brown family, Brown. all right. I know that Michael um, Woodford has been very ill, but is home and doing better. Is that correct? And Beth has also been very sick all week. So uh, doing a little bit better there. Here, I will let you. Uh, my granddaughter, Karen, 
has fully been vaccinated, but she teaches gymnastics and she has come down with COVID. Okay. So it's not, not really bad, but it's still scary. Yeah, still, still ill. Yes, so others. Bob. Um, a couple of things uh, to remind you to continue to pray for Tim and Tammy. Uh, they're having a hard time with it. Um, the paper reported this morning that um, the Russian army is on the border of Ukraine and there is significant information, at least our president says so, that um, intelligence that they are planning an assault. And that is a world at the edge of war again. Yes. I would ask for prayers for my friend, Lorna. Um, I had brought her up uh, several months ago. She had cancer. Um, she continues to have cancer. She is um, going to see specialists and hoping for some trials. So please uh, keep her in your prayers. Um, also prayers for the whole Oxford High School community and um, the family of the young man who perpetrated um, the crime, but also the, the families, of course, of all of the children who were affected. Anybody else? Dorinda. I think we need to be praying for our country. I was reading, I think this was out of the Time Magazine this week, that during 2020, there was an increase of 6% over the previous year of American hate crimes against Blacks and Black people, African Americans. So our country's in desperate need of some prayer. Others. All right, then let's go to God in prayer. God, we like the ancient Israelites are waiting. We are awaiting the fulfillment of your promises. And sometimes, although we trust you, it's really hard to wait. We pray for the Brown family as they struggle with grief and health issues. We struggle with, we pray for Tim and Tammy as they uh, continue to struggle with the grief of losing a child. We pray for Beth and Taryn and Michael and pray that your healing power might be at work in all of their bodies, as well as Becky's friend who is struggling with cancer. And yet, God, we also pray for those bigger things, those things that maybe feel and seem impossible the violence in our world, the threat of war, violence in our communities and our schools, violence against one another. God, help us to say with Mary, here I am, the servant of the Lord. And God, help us to be your people. Help us to plant seeds of peace and hope where there is division and violence and strife. And help us, God, to continue to await the coming of the Christ child with true hope and joy. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. 
Amen. Please join me in singing My Soul Rejoices in the Lord to the tune of I Sing the Mighty Power of God. <clears throat> Our second scripture is taken from Luke 1, verses 26 to 55. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your room and bury son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is a sixth month for her who was said to be barren for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. 
And why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped with joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has looked with favor on the loneliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud with the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. forever. I didn't want to leave this here in the middle during the first part of the service because I didn't want to block the nativity set behind me. It's so pretty and we get to see it so infrequently, right? Just this time of year that I wanted to make sure everybody got a chance to, to uh, look at it. So, so first of all, thank you for uh, letting me have last Sunday off and I got to spend time with family and that was a real blessing. So I hope that you all had a good Thanksgiving as well with people that you love. Um, and we're able to remember all the many things that we do indeed have to be thankful for. So last time we were together, um, we talked about the different voices in the Bible. We talked about the voices of the priests and the prophets and the poets and the sages and the storytellers. Um, and in his the chapter that we would have covered last week, McLaren talks about the prophets as custodians of the best hopes, desires, and dreams of their society. Um, but he also goes on to say that dreams and desires and hopes inspire action, that in that way they're different from wishing, um, that we can wish for things and that doesn't mean that they're going to happen, that if we really are going to dream and desire and hope for something, that means we need to, to take action to make that come true. Um, and that the poets often challenge people to act in ways consistent with those hopes and dreams and desires. Isaiah, uh, which we have looked at a lot and is the most often quoted prophet in the Gospels, talks of a vision of a restored Israel. Um, and that's the hope and desire and dream that the people are reaching for. Well, the angels that come to Zechariah and Mary and Elizabeth and Mary themselves all speak out of this prophetic tradition, all speak of Israel's hopes, dreams, and desires for a better future. Now, while Elizabeth's infertility echoes back to the story of Sarah, think about it, there's an elderly woman who has been barren and through the gift of God is able to conceive and, and bear a child long past her prime. Her infertility also reflects the state of Israel's hopes, desires, and dreams, barren and frustrated by one empire after another. McLaren writes that to be alive in the adventure of Jesus is to have a desire, a dream, a hope for the future. It is to translate that hope for the future into action in the present and to keep acting in light of it. So when the angel comes to speak to Zechariah and Mary, these hopes, dreams, and desires seem frustrated and barren. And indeed, the stories that we have read this morning are about a barren old woman and a poor young woman, women on the edge. 
And Mary uh, is going to be pushed even further to the edge as she becomes an unwed mother in a time where that could lead to even being killed. She and Elizabeth, as a barren woman who did not produce children, are the least of these, the ignored, the looked down on. These are not stories about the rich and the powerful or the wealthy. These are women whose perspective is from the edge, from below. And when we read these stories and hear them, they seem impossible. But McLaren points out that maybe that's the point. Is the point of these stories to challenge us to blur the line between what we think is possible and what we think is impossible? Maybe that's the point. Spears beaten into plowshares, the predatory rich lying down in peace with the vulnerable and poor, the lions lying with the lambs, God's justice flowing like a river to the lowest places on earth, the brokenhearted comforted and poor receiving good news. These things seem impossible, don't they? We actually had conversation about this during Sunday school this morning, and Bob actually asked the question, you know, as much as we want these things to happen, and as much as we hear these promises, are they truly possible? We carry around deep fears about our lives and about our world. One fear we may carry is this fear that it's too late to hope, like Elizabeth, that somehow we missed our opportunity. Another fear, like Mary's, may be that it's too soon, that it's unrealistic to hope something this good could happen now and here. McLaren writes, maybe it's not too late, though, for something beautiful to be born. Maybe it's not too soon either. Maybe the present moment is pregnant with possibilities we can't see or even imagine. What does it mean to dare to hope that the seemingly impossible is possible? How might that challenge us to align our lives around the impossible possibilities hidden in this present pregnant moment. Nothing is impossible with God, proclaims the angel. Now, life coaches are often uh, known for asking questions like, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? But maybe that's the wrong question. Maybe the question that we as Christians need to ask is what would you do if you knew God could not fail? What would you do if you knew that God can do the impossible? Well, what Mary does is trust this God of hope, the God who gave the dream, and she decides to act. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your will. In the Orthodox Church, Mary is called the Theotokos, which means the God bearer. Mary presents herself, humbles herself, and allows God to use her and transform her. And the result is that she becomes the Theotokos, the God bearer. If you read the passage from Isaiah that was in the book this week, she becomes the one who bears Emmanuel, which means God with us. What would it look like for us to, be give, to give birth to Christ? Can we become God bearers as well? Can we become Theotokos? What would that look like? What would happen if we woke up every morning and said, here I am, the servant of the Lord. May it be to me according to your word. What impossibilities might become possible?
Mary's song voices the hopes, dreams, and desires of her people, and ours too, I would venture. And it also echoes the song of another Old Testament prophet, Hannah. It's a song about God bringing justice on earth, about the reversal of the high and the low, the poor and the wealthy, the barren and the fertile, the full and the hungry, the center and the edge. The prophetic tradition that Mary sings out of is not about predicting the future. It's about transformation, about change, about a reversal of the ways of the world to the ways of God. The Magnificat, which is what Mary's song is called, makes clear that the kingdom of God will not come from those with traditional authority. Ancient leaders were seen as human divine hybrids, sons of God who exercised violent power. And that is still the way of human power today. No human king, no human leader can bring about the kingdom of God. The expectations of the Jewish people cannot happen because power always gets corrupted. Power of that type, political power and authority always gets corrupted. So Jesus, God sent another type of leader in Jesus, also a divine human hybrid, not a son of the gods, but the son of God, the son of the most high. Again, if you read the passage in Isaiah, you heard this baby is to be called Emmanuel, God with us, God for us, God in us, but also wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father and prince of peace. This is a leader who will transform the world, not by inflicting violence, but by absorbing it. Not with a king's use of force and oppression, but with a mother's sense of justice and compassion. Not by force, but by compassion, feeding, healing, touching, and loving. Jesus will model, says um, McLaren, the same self-surrender and receptivity to God as his mother, even to the point of death on a Roman cross. The kingdom of God that Mary sings of will be the work of the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you noticed when you read that passage about Zechariah and Mary and Elizabeth, how many times The Holy Spirit is mentioned as the one who's doing something in that passage. The Holy Spirit is the one, the Spirit of Christ, who will bring life in the midst of barrenness, making the impossible possible. It's God's power entering through a different way. God aligning with a different kind of creative power, the creative power of a pregnant moment full of possibility. Mary's song will be fulfilled as the Holy Spirit transforms us into the very likeness of Christ. Little by little, person by person, theotokos by theotokos, from the edge to the center. Some of you may be familiar with family systems theory, which is um, a a psychological theory that talks about groups of people and how they interact with each other. Specifically, it starts out with families, right? And some of the things that um, are important about family systems theory is that change happens within a system, within a family or another group, as one person gets healthier. Now, the thing about that is you can only change yourself. We have to realize we can't change anybody else, not directly, but we can change ourselves. And when we change ourselves, the system will push back and try to bring us back to the way we were before, because that's how the system is comfortable, right? But if we continue with our increased health, eventually the system will shift just a little bit more toward health. But it's important during that time, especially that time of pushback, to maintain our connection 
with those in the system with us, right? While we still maintain our boundaries of who we are and what we believe. The truth is that not only families are systems, but church is a system, culture is a system, the worldwide web of humanity is a system. And the only way that we improve those systems is by staying connected with others and maintaining our boundaries of who we are and what we believe and what is important to us. And we only do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. And let's be honest, we do it imperfectly. <laughs> I, I could share a story from last weekend where I did something very imperfectly in that kind of situation. I won't, but um, if you want to know later, if you want to know later, come and ask me about it. Thankfully, I have a, a very wise husband who helped me talk through it and, and get back on track. I, and I just say that to say that we have to recognize, you know, that we all have those moments when our boundaries and our connection get kind of messed up. We're human. And that's why, as we talked about in, in a Sunday school, that probably this is never going to ever be fully realized by humans. Because we all are going to have those moments. We're human. That's part of being human, right? We, we mess up sometimes. But we need to continue to allow the Holy Spirit to try to transform us a little bit by little bit, day by day, moment by moment, encounter by encounter. Each of us scatters seeds into the garden of the world each day of our lives. We scatter healthy seeds or we scatter unhealthy seeds. We scatter seeds of love or animosity, seeds of peace or hostility, seeds of reconciliation or division, seeds of generosity or greed, seeds of compassion or hard-heartedness. And those seeds that we scatter are gonna grow up into plants that scatter more seeds. So we need to allow the Holy Spirit to transform us so that most of the time, at least, we're scattering good and healthy seeds. The hopes, dreams, and desires of God in that way can grow invasively as we bear God from the edges of the world. Transformation requires us to be obedient to God as Mary was to be self-reflective and recognize those times when we fall short and to be humble and willing to allow God to continue to work on us. The call is to print our, present ourselves to God every morning with the same words as Mary. Here I am, the Lord's servant. Romans 12 which was also one of the scriptures for today, encourages us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. And often in this being self-reflective, we need a soul friend. We need somebody, there's a Celtic term, anamkara, which means soul friend. It's somebody that we can go to, right? Who will see us for who we are and love us anyway, and yet still be honest with us. Mary and Elizabeth seem to have this kind of relationship that in this time of upheaval and surprise and change, they could go and they could be together and they could draw one another closer to God. And we have to be humble because we have to be willing to die to who we are to become who God wants us to be. And in that vein, I want to take a minute. I'm going to share a parable with you. It's called the parable of the acorn. And maybe you've heard it before. I don't know. It was new to me. Once upon a time in a not so far away land, there was a kingdom of acorns nestled at the foot of a grand old oak tree. Since the citizens of this kingdom were modern, fully westernized acorns, they went about their business with purposeful energy. 
And since they were midlife baby boomer acorns, they engaged in a lot of self-help courses. There were seminars called getting all you can out of your shell. There were woundedness and recovery groups for acorns who had been bruised in their original fall from the tree. There were spas for oiling and polishing those shells and various acornopathic therapies to enhance longevity and well-being. One day in the midst of this kingdom, there suddenly appeared a naughty little stranger, apparently dropped out of the blue by a bird. He was capless and dirty, making an immediate negative impression on his fellow acorns. And crouched beneath the oak tree, he stammered out a wild tale. Pointing upward at the tree, he said, we are that. Delusional thinking. Obviously, the other acorns concluded, but one of them continued to engage him in conversation. So tell us, how would we become that tree? Well, he said, pointing downward, it has something to do with going into the ground and cracking open the shell. Insane, they responded, totally morbid. Why, then we wouldn't be acorns anymore. Humor aside, it is obvious to all of us that an acorn is meant to become uh, a, an oak tree. We all know this. But this oak tree of myself can also come into being only if it lets go of being an acorn. Oh, there were pictures of acorns, sorry. McLaren concludes this way. That's what it means to be alive in the adventure of Jesus. We present ourselves to God, our bodies, our stories, our futures, our possibilities, even our limitations. Here I am, we say with Mary, the Lord's servant. Let it be with me according to your will. May it be so. Would you stand with me if you're able? And we'll sing together the first verse of Come the Long Expected Jesus as we prepare to celebrate communion together. Being the first Sunday of the month, it is Communion Sunday for us, the day that we remember and celebrate that night when Jesus gathered with his disciples, the night before he was betrayed, the night before he was crucified. And so we read um, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians that on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat for this is my body broken for you. This table is Christ's table, 
Christ is the one who breaks the bread and pours the wine. And so all who seek to follow Christ are welcome at his table. Uh, because of COVID, as we move forward through this observance today, uh, Kevin will come and serve you. You are invited to just put your hands out. He will place the bread or the cup into your hands so that everybody's not touching everything. All right. All right. Kevin, would you pray for us, please, for the bread? We remember, Lord Jesus, that you absorbed the violence of this world into your body. And so we will partake of this broken bread. And as we receive this reminder, as we receive you, help us then to turn and be willing to present ourselves to be a living sacrifice, to be able to say to you, here I am, use me, amen. Let us eat for thanks with thanksgiving. Paul goes on to share that after they had eaten dinner, Jesus took a cup, filled it with wine, and shared it again with his disciples, saying, Take and drink this, all of you, for this is the cup of the new covenant pour out in my blood. Would you pray with me? God, we give thanks that Jesus is not only our Savior, but also our model. That like his mother before him, on the night before his crucifixion, when he faced something so hard, he said, Lord, if it's possible, take this cup from me. But if not, your will be done and not mine. Lord, we also face so many difficulties in this world. And often it is so hard to be the one who plants the healthy seed. But God, help us like both Mary and Jesus to be willing to say, here I am the servant of the Lord. Amen.
Let us drink with a commitment to the same dedication that both Mary and Jesus showed to doing the will of God. All right. I believe we are going to sing again. Rob, come lead us. Let's join together to sing uh, verse two of Come the Long Expected Jesus. Uh, and then we'll remain standing if you're able uh, for our benediction. Let's sing together. morning with the words of Mary in your heart and on your lips and I want to ask you to repeat after me here I am, here I am. the Lord's servant, the Lord's servant. May, it be with me according to your word. may it be with me according to your word amen John is going to take us off of Facebook, um, and so we can visit with one another for a few minutes. There we go. I see.